when people start asking you those tough questions, you start to fall apart. And falling apart doesn't necessarily mean, Jay, you have the wrong answer. It could also mean something like this. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, Jay, good question. Uh, yeah, so the answer to this question. So even if I might know the answer, the conviction and how I'm sharing that answer is the perception of that is completely different from the investor's perspective. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, also known as the Private Money Authority. My guest today has helped his clients raise private money by using what's called pitch decks. Well, what in the world is a pitch deck? My guest is going to talk all about that. In fact, one of his clients raised $2 million using this method. Well, my guest today, in addition to what I said, he's the founder of Master Talk. And Master Talk is where he helps business owners like you become the top 1% communicators in their business. And after all, we know the better you communicate, the more private money you attract. In just a moment, you're going to be meeting my special guest, Brendan Kumarase, right after this. So first of all, I've got to say to my audio engineer, my editor, and my producer, please edit in the correct pronunciation of Brenda's last name, which is Kumar Asami, <laughs> which, I, which I royally messed up uh, in the intro there, Brendan. But anyway, Brendan, welcome to the show. It's great to be here, Jay. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm so excited. And of course, I know we have thousands and thousands of listeners who cannot see you on video as I can right now as we are live streaming on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn. But all I can say, I wish I looked 14 years old and was as smart as you are when I was like started coaching, you know, my clients. But anyway, Brendan, <laughs> why don't you give everybody for a second your background and how in the world is it that you are qualified to work with clients, help them raise millions of dollars. Like, how is it that you became a master communicator and you can help others do the same thing? Absolutely, Jay. And and for the record, I'm 12 years old, for those who are wondering. So, <laughs> so, 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 well, you look 12. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I get that I get that point a lot. So so happy to elaborate. So so for me, Jay, you know, the journey started when I was in, in college. I went to business school. And I studied in accounting. So I was a numbers guy. I wasn't looking to be an entrepreneur. I wasn't looking to be a coach. And then what happened is I started competing in these things called taste competitions. Think of it like professional sports, but for nerds. So while other guys my age were playing rugby or basketball or baseball, I wasn't one of those guys, Jay. I did presentations competitively. That's how I learned how to speak. But then as I got older, I started coaching a lot of students on how to convey ideas effectively. And that's how I learned the fundamentals of communication coaching. For the context of today's podcast, though, how did I go on to help some clients raise a bunch of, uh, like millions of dollars? It's not the core of my business. It's probably 5 to 10% of our, of our take-home revenue. But how that worked out is I have a very niche practice specifically for technology CEOs. So tech CEOs who are in the early stages, who are raising venture capital for venture capitalists specifically. And the reason I got a lot of experience in that area is because I did a year in venture capital when I was a college student. And a lot of my friends are technology CEOs who are in their 20s, and they're raising millions of dollars for their tech startup. But when they got started, they were broke. They couldn't really afford a coach. So this is seven years ago at this point for me. When I started helping them, it was mostly just to help them with their pitch deck to make sure they can answer investor questions more effectively. And then I was able to develop a deep expertise in that specific niche where, where a lot of my raising money experience comes from. 
Well, as, as I said in the intro, um, I have observed, and I know from personal experience, and I've worked with thousands of real estate investors, uh, coaching them since 2011 on how to raise money for their real estate deals. I have observed one common thread. Well, I've observed more than one common thread, but one in particular common thread is my clients who are better communicators naturally and easily attract money for their business much quicker. They attract a whole lot more money much quicker. So first of all, Brendan, why would you say, what is it? I mean, I've got a 99% uh, assurity of my answer, but what would you say, why is it, what's the connection between being a master communicator and being the top 1%, you know, producer in your industry, i.e. raising a bunch of money and doing a bunch of real estate deals? Yeah, absolutely. It's a fantastic question. You know, from, from our vantage point, there's a lot of different layers to communication. But one that stands out to me in the context of raising capital is how are we answering the questions that investors and stakeholders are asking us? So since most of your audience is raising capital for real estate, that looks like family offices. That looks like syndicates. That looks like different investing communities that are asking you really hard questions about the returns that you're making off the properties. What are the description of those properties? How well do you know what you're buying in the market? And the problem, Jay, unfortunately, whether it's real estate or any other industry, most people who are raising capital do not spend enough time prepping for those meetings. I call this bulletproofing a deck, where you've answered so many questions about your industry, about the property you're raising capital for, about the tech startup you're raising capital for. And in those situations, when people start asking you those tough questions, you start to fall apart. And falling apart doesn't necessarily mean, Jay, you have the wrong answer. It could also mean something like this. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, Jay, good question. Uh, yeah, so the answer to this question. So even if I might know the answer, the conviction and how I'm sharing that answer is the perception of that is completely different from the investor's perspective. So there's kind of two parts. The first part is the quality of the answer we're delivering for the stakeholder, for the end investor. But the other part is we're answering a question subconsciously in the investor's mind, which is, do I believe this person has the conviction to see this deal through so I don't lose my money? And if I smell a whiff that this person doesn't know what they're talking about, they don't have that conviction, we don't put a dollar into that business or in that investment property. And that's where I see the difference between who, who communicates well and who doesn't. The word that I heard you say more than once was the word conviction. And <clears throat> it's been my experience. I can't come across, first of all, with conviction. I can't come across with um, passion. That, that's another nuance. Like the passion is not the same as conviction, but I can't come across with passion. I can't come across with conviction that first of all, I know what I'm talking about. Number two, whether I know what I'm talking about or not, I'm convinced I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> right. And, and number three, I've heard it said, and I say it all the time, if you don't believe in you, who else is going to believe in you, right? It's like, unless I believe in what I'm doing, unless I have, I love your word, unless I have that total. So let me ask you, let me ask you, what I was going to say is, unless I've got that total conviction, I'm not going to be having people attracted to me and, you know, to what I do. So here's the question. I mean, I visit with potential clients and I don't feel their heart. I don't feel their conviction. I don't feel their passion. And I'm thinking to myself, until you get that fixed, it don't matter how much you study what we got going on. So here's the question, Brendan. How does somebody get conviction? I mean, it's like whether you're raising money, it doesn't matter what you're presenting. If you want someone to buy in to what you are communicating, do you agree? It doesn't matter the topic. You got to have conviction. How does somebody get conviction? 
Absolutely, Jay. So conviction comes from two main areas. The first one is a deep expertise in what we're selling, whether that whether that dream is a better investment return in a, on a real estate property, whether that is a better return on a technology startup that we're investing in. It's having deep expertise, which then breeds conviction. That's one part. But the other part, to your point, is not the full picture. Because if you just have that, but you're conveying every single idea really badly, you don't get the idea. The second piece of conviction is through the technical pieces of communication. Let me give you a small example of this. There's a very big difference, Jane. I want everyone to pay attention to my face here. There's a very big difference here between uh, I don't know and I don't know I'll get back to you. So let's watch that again. I, I don't know and I don't know. I'm saying the same thing. I don't know the answer to the question, but the difference, the energy that I'm projecting is very different, Jay. The first person who's looking around the place, who looks a little bit shy, who has a shaky voice, they're telling more than just, I don't know the answer to the question. They're telling the investors, hey, I don't really know what I'm doing. This is my first project. I'm kind of nervous to be here. I don't really know if this is going to work. Maybe you should give me your money. So it's creating a lot of doubt in the mind of the investor. Whereas the second person who goes, hey, I don't know, but I'll get back to you. They still don't know the answer, but they're still injecting confidence indirectly into the investor's minds that, hey, I'm going to figure out the answer to your question. Just give me some time to get back to my team and I'll make sure that we deliver on the promise that, we, that you had, that concern that you had brought up. And that's really the piece of convention that I think is much easier to practice, which really comes down, Jay, to doing small daily activities every single day to work on that muscle. Let me give you one example. I'll throw it back to you. The random word exercise. Pick a word like a light bulb, like home, like doorknob, and create random 60-second presentations out of thin air. And this serves two main purposes in the investing community, Jay. One is it helps us deal with uncertainty. You never know what an investor or a client is going to ask you about what you're sharing in the world. So if you can talk about avocado toast for 60 seconds, it's going to be really easy for you to talk about situations pertaining to your expertise because that's what you're raising across different family offices. And the other piece is if you can make sense out of nonsense, Jay, you can make sense out of anything. So if you can talk about light bulbs, it's really easy to go back to your core expertise and speak more confidently with that. So just do that a few times a day. Very interesting. So I want you to go back, Brendan, and I want you to say one more time, both ways that you, as a presenter, someone asks you a question and you say, I don't know, say it both ways. And then I have an interpretation. Absolutely. Jay, more than happy to do that. So the first version is, um, I don't know, Jay. I don't really think about it. Let me get back to you. And the second version is, I don't know. I'll get back to you. So when I heard you, and of course, where I'm seeing you on video, thousands of people would just be listening. But there was a distinct difference in your voice and your intonation and your rhythm of speech. Uh, there was like a gap in between the flow of the sentence. There was this hesitation. I mean, it's like you as the presenter hesitated, me as your private lender, I'm now going to hesitate because I'm now going to mirror what I'm seeing, what I'm feeling, right? I'm going to mirror how you're coming across. But in that first, uh, I don't know, I'll get back to you. What I actually heard you communicate, very so on, very much so on purpose. What I heard you communicate was, I don't know. And I really don't know have have a clue as to how to go get the answer. <laughs> it's really what I heard you communicate. And the second way I heard you say, I don't know, I'll get back to you. Even with your facial expression, what I heard you communicate was, I don't know right now, but I know where to get the answer. I know it will be the correct answer. And I will get back to you. In fact, the first way you answered, I don't know. I didn't even feel as though you were going to get back to me at all. <laughs> you know, so so what you're really bringing out here are some really, really powerful nuances that are really not nuances. They're like really, really important, important P 
pieces of this communication thing. So, first of all, let's give everybody a gift, Brennan, for hanging in with us for 14 minutes and 37 seconds so far into the show. And that is, if you are a real estate investor and if you're struggling at all with raising private money for your deals, or you're a seasoned real estate investor and you want more private money for your deals, I got a free gift for you. I just recently wrote this gift. It's called Why Private Money Will Skyrocket Your Real Estate Investing Business and Help You Build Incredible Wealth. Seven reasons. You can download this uh, private money guide. It will put you on the fast track to getting private money. Download it at jayconner.com. And that's with an E-R, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash money guide. That's Jay Connor, J A Y C O N N E R dot com forward slash money guide to get you on the fast track to getting private money for your real estate deals. Brendan, when you are working with your clients or you are crafting a new presentation, uh, first of all, what's a pitch deck? You and I want to know what a pitch deck is. Most people know what a pitch deck is, but just to be sure everybody knows, what's a pitch deck? Absolutely, Jay. And one other point I wanted to drive is you articulated the last point very, very well. I actually have to steal that next time because you said it so well. When when somebody says, I don't know in a shaky voice, you're t you're telling the audience that that person is, is never not does not only doesn't know the answer, but is never going to find it. So I learned a lot from that. So so very, very good share, Jay. In the context of the pitch deck, what is it at the end of the day? Let's start with what is the objective of communication? Communication is how do we convey an idea in a way that achieves a specific outcome for a specific audience, right? How do we convey an idea in a way that achieves a specific result for a specific audience? So what a pitch, back, pitch deck ultimately boils down to, Jay, is it's an, it's an investment vehicle. It's a tool that we use, which is often a slide deck of PowerPoint slides that allows us to achieve a specific result, which is often of raising capital from these, these different stakeholders and achieving that outcome for that specific audience. And that's what a pitch deck is. Thank you. So when you are creating, crafting, writing, putting together a pitch deck from scratch, new topic, new client, whatever, my guess is and you correct me if I'm wrong, but my guess is you have a roadmap. You, you have a template. You have a pathway, no matter what the presentation is, as to how are we, how are we going to craft and create a successful presentation, regardless of the topic, et cetera. First of all, is that true? You have a template or, or a, a, an outline more or less to follow in crafting such a thing. Absolutely, Jay. So there's two parts to this answer, and I'll, I'll let you decide which one you want to dive into. So the first one is more the general ideas. What are two to three points generally that will apply for any pitch deck across any industry that people just don't do? Just based on the conversation I have with my CEOs, they just don't do these three things. Whether you're in real estate, you're in tech, you're in any industry, you'll master. In terms of the template, I do have one, but is contextual to the industry that I'm in. So for example, if I'm coaching a specific client, which might not be your audience today, if I'm coaching a, a technology CEO on raising venture capital, that pitch has a specific formula that you need to follow to be successful. But the main idea here is don't reinvent the wheel. So in the same way, for example, you want to raise private money, Jay's got a great framework. I'm sure it's amazing. And it's probably better than what I had because it's industry specific to the outcome that he's raising money on, which is real estate for uh, private money for real estate deals. Whereas the template I have is also contextual to the to the platform that I'm in. So if I have a, a venture capitalist who's raising capital, I know exactly how to structure that pitch deck in a way that gets the 2 million, in a way that gets the 500K check for their seed round. So, so I'll let you, Jay, kind of dive into what, where do you prefer? Do you prefer generalized tips that you think apply across the board? Or do you want me to go deeper into the, the industry-specific knowledge I have in, in tech investing? Yeah, let's. Uh, I like I like the topic of uh, the general that would apply to like everyone. I mean, what are those three or more uh, mistakes 
that presenters make when they're crafting a presentation and they just don't get it right. So now you can tell us how to get it right. Absolutely. Absolutely, Jason. Happy to go into that. So, so for the general pointers, let's go with the basic one, one that we talked about earlier, but I can't, I can't emphasize this one enough, is that not, not enough people who build pitch decks or investor decks take the time to bulletproof their pitch. So what does this mean? What this means, Jay, is when they build out a deck, they just go to a family office, they go to a stakeholder, they pitch. But the mistake that they make that they don't realize is the investing community is really small. So if you mess up one of these pitches, especially for you're your trying to raise capital for a very specific deal or a specific um, uh, asset, well, what happens is there's not 100 million people who invest in that specific asset. So if you mess up, all of the other offices are going to know about it. That's why it's so important for you to book even a few hours, especially if you're raising seven, eight, nine figure rounds, where you're actually spending at least at the bare minimum a few hours of you presenting your presentation to either a coach or a group of people who have already been there, done that, who will poke holes in your pitch. And their goal, in the way I coach it anyways, because I'm all about making sure people get the result, the goal is to try and find as many flaws as possible in the deck. Hey, could you go to slide seven? Okay, you mentioned this, 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 but what, what's, what's the goal? Okay, what's the go-to-market? What happens when we get this property? Talk to me more about the property. Pitch it to me. Just ask them a bunch of questions until they're absolutely perfect. That's the first piece that I would recommend that I'm happy to go into the other two. Yeah, so on that first piece is part of that process identifying as many potential objections to the offer, to the pitch, and answering those objections perhaps before the questions are actually raised. That's correct. So, so the answer would be both in this case, Jay. So I'll give you an example from my core industry expertise. So like a, qu a question I get often asked from my clients, from, from investors, is what's your point of view as a founder? Where do you think the future of X industry is going? So if the founder isn't able to answer that question appropriately, they're dead in the water because the investor just won't trust their instincts as a business owner to get the result. So it's two parts. One is making a list of a ton of questions that people can ask. Like one, one for example, I see a lot in the real estate world is, is really a walkthrough of the property. What are we buying? What's the location? What makes this property so attractive relative to market prices that I could pay elsewhere? Why do you want me to invest in Florida relative to New York? What is it about real estate in Florida that you feel is so unique based on your deep industry expertise. Look, if somebody is raising capital for real estate, Jay, and you probably know this better than I do, they can answer those basic questions. Like, why would I give you a half a million dollar check or a million dollar check to, to invest it back into the property? So that's the main idea here is to make a list of all of those questions and practice them every day. Like take one of those questions for a few minutes and just answer it with yourself. But if you do that for a year, Jay, you'll have answered 365 questions about your industry and you'll be bulletproof. And that's the reason why I gained prominence really earlier in my career in communication is that when I would start coaching people who are much older than me and I started showing up with answers to questions that they thought I didn't have the answer to, they would go, oh, okay, this person clearly knows what they're talking about and my credibility skyrockets. Whereas if you don't do that prep work, you get into a lot of trouble with different stakeholders. Well, and I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, I, pra I practice it and I preach it all the time. You know, the money's not only in the follow-up, the money, first of all, is in the preparation. And when presenting and communicating investment opportunity, uh, communicating what we call the private lending program, the communication, the sentences have just got to fall off your tongue as though you're just having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a, you know, over a cup of coffee, you know, uh, in fact, that's one thing I think. And when I, and like last week, I was presenting all week long at a conference. And uh, when I'm presenting on stage, I'm not presenting to the audience, even though I am, I'm presenting, I'm talking to one person. I'm looking at that one person in the audience, one phrase or uh one set of words you have said more than once, Brendan, I want to make sure everyone understands when you say you're presenting or you're pitching to a 
family office or family offices. Um, tell everyone what that means. Absolutely, absolutely, Jay. So, so generally, when when you're pitching to a family office, first of all, it depends on the family office. Some some of them have a really structured process and on how to get a deal through. Others, it's more of a generalized conversation. You have a deep relationship. But essentially, what happens is you have high net worth clients. Usually above 20 million is usually the benchmark, 10 to 20 million. And because they have a lot of capital to manage, instead of them managing it on their own, like an individual investor would, they actually hire employees and staff to actually manage that capital for them. So a family office might have like a CPA who's looking at their taxes. They might have a couple of general partners who are managing that family office, who are sourcing the deals for the person who owns the capital. That's what a family office is. Excellent. All right. What's number two? Perfect. Number two is the puzzle method. So what is the puzzle method, Jay? Whenever we're working on a jigsaw puzzle, you know those little pieces you used to play as kids, it's like fire pieces, a thousand pieces, and we got to try to put them together. The question we need to ask ourselves, Jay, is when we work on a jigsaw puzzle, which pieces do we start with first? And most of us would answer the edges to that question, Jay, because they're easier to find in the box. Okay, you open the jigsaw puzzle, you take the corner pieces, you work around, and then you work your way into the middle. Why am I telling you that story? I'm telling you that story, Jay, because unfortunately, with our pitches, our presentations, or really anything we present, we do the opposite. We start with the middle first. We shove a bunch of content in the presentation, we ramble throughout the whole thing, and the last slide sounds something like this. Uh, yeah, so thanks. Not the right approach. So instead... <laughs> <laughs> right? Hey, that, that was pretty awful. That was yeah. pretty awful. <laughs> and I'm sure, I'm sure we've both seen those pitch decks in both of our careers, but the, the idea is, how do we fix this? Practice and present like a jigsaw puzzle. Practice the edges first. So instead of practicing a 45 minute pitch over and over again and getting tired, just go to the first five minutes of the presentation and practice that 10 times, 20 times until it's perfect. And what's great is it doesn't take that much time because if you practice it 10 times and it's a three to five minute pitch at the beginning, it's only 30 to 50 minutes. Same thing with the conclusion. What's a great movie with a terrible ending? Last time I checked, terrible movie then work your way into the middle and then if you really nail that first five minutes people be really interested into into the rest so even if you go into something boring like cap tables and all the numbers and the finances people will pay attention because you crush the beginning interesting so what you're saying about the second most important part of creating any presentation is framing <laughs> no pun intended, framing that conversation with, what would you say, attention-getting conversation? Um, do you say it's a good idea to frame the, the, the presentation with, here's where we're going, here's where we're going kind of thing? How, how, what's another example of, like specific example of, Framing a conversation by using the corners of a jigsaw puzzle. What's an example of that? Excellent follow-up question, Jay. And that will be based on the industry, so I'll give you a few ideas. So in tech, it's you start your first two-minute presentation, and you really outline the problem statement. The problem statement is, what's the problem in society right now, which, which necessitates the solution that you're driving your company with, which then leads to, hey, give me money so I can build this solution out. Here's all the results I've already achieved. That's how you would do it in tech. In real estate, it's fairly similar, where you can start with, hey, this is who I am. This is what we're going to talk about today, which you can do for a couple of seconds. But the main idea in the first five minutes is to really sell the asset. So if I was, a, if I was trying to get multifamily, well, sorry, it was, I was trying to raise a round for a multifamily property. The first five minutes of the pitch is really my traction. 
here, these are the 10 properties we've invested in the last seven years. This is the ROI that we've achieved. And if it's just one property, it's one property, right? You're just honest about the traction. So you see, get results. And then the first three minutes for me in that industry, but feel free to jump in as well. It's usually a description of the property that you're buying, that your clients are buying into, but not a, te a this is a mistake I see a lot of these, not a 50 minute overview. This is how many bathrooms there are. This is how many pipes are in the building versus like what are the main highlights that will make your property feel sexy to the family office that's what the first five minutes of that pitch looks like based on my expertise but of course i'd love to hear your thoughts as well yeah so our focus is actually single family houses i've got a lot of friends that do syndicate they raise millions of private money for multi-family for commercial deals yeah. We focus on single family. So we actually separate the conversation to where, first of all, we attract the private money of people that have money that want to invest without having a deal associated with that conversation. Initially, we teach, we put on our teacher hat. So we're not asking for any money. We teach what our private lending program is. Then once the private lender or private lender say, hey, I'm really interested in that. Let's do a deal. Then in a week or two, we may bring back a single family house and say, hey, you know, I've got great news. We can now put your money to work for you. And, you know, here's the house. Here's the after repaired value. Here's the funding required. And we frame the, all the conversation without actually directly asking for money. So instead of, you know, the traditional way of borrowing money and going to the bank or the mortgage company and getting on your hands and knees and begging and saying, please fund my deal. We teach the opportunity and then we give them good news. Instead of asking for a mortgage, we offer, uh, offer a mortgage. And then finally, Brendan, your number three tip. Absolutely. No, number three, Jay, and thanks for that. Number three is find allies. So this is not a straightforward tip, but it'll really help you, especially if you're looking to raise capital repeatedly in the same industry. Like most of the people I've seen, and thanks for the clarification on single family, like most of my experience is mostly in multi, where you'll see family offices working with the same people over and over again. That's how they'll raise the capital. But in the, in the context for number three, it's try and find allies, industry experts that you can befriend. So for example, Whenever I'm, I'm helping a client raise money for tech, of course, my opinion is valid, right? I'll go into it. I'll find the weaknesses in the deck, but it won't just be me. I'll bring three other technology CEOs who raised seven figure rounds in the, in the last six months who are just friends of mine. And I'll just say, what do you think, Brian? What do you think, Justin? What do you think, Julia? What vantage points can you bring? Finding allies is a really important step to, to, to being successful at pitches long term because it allows you to take a step back from your pitch when the pitch is over and to have dinner with them and really ask them a fundamental question that is missed in a lot of this preparation work, Jay, which is what is important to you and why? What is important to you and why? And it's a simple question. But it's one that most people looking to raise capital don't really ask investors enough. Like besides a return, what else are you looking for? You know, there's some investors who might say, you know what, I'm really just looking to raise capital in, uh, oh, sorry, not raise capital, but invest capital in my own state. Some people are more local. Other people are more open. They say, you know, I really like spreading my money throughout the world, not just in the US. I want real estate in Canada. I want real estate in X country. So asking the people in your investor pool what is important to them and why will help you tailor your pitch deck more effectively to the messaging of the end user. So when you actually go in front of them and you're pitching, it really feels like you're speaking to them directly versus you just taking a generalized template that you keep copy pasting across 50 different in investor meetings you have that, that quarter of that year. Isn't it amazing how much better we can serve our clients when we really know what they want and what's important to them? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Instead of us thinking, you know, what I've learned over the years, what I think is important to my customers and clients, sometimes they could care less, right? So how about just ask them? I love it. Well, this has been phenomenal, Brendan. Please let everyone know how they can continue the conversation with you. And before you answer that question, answer this question. Who is your ideal client that you would love to work with? 
Yeah, absolutely, Jay. And thanks so much for having me on the show. This is super fun. So the the ideal client for us, we primarily work with executives in the corporate world who are looking to level up their careers. That's one niche that we're specialized in. And the the other one is generally entrepreneurs who are looking to raise capital. So if you're someone who is trying to raise, but you're making a lot of basic mistakes in your communication, the ums and ahs, the eye contact isn't there. That's really where, where we help people just fix a lot of those areas. So we can turn the uh, uh, I don't know to the, I don't know. Right. That's, that's the way that <laughs> we think about and, it. And that was just a matter of inflection. Uh, I don't know, or I don't know, but I'll get back to you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's one of many, of course, with specific raising capital, I'm sure you're, you're the expert with that Jay, but for us, it's really just like making sure that the communication side of it is figured out. So you're, you're not shaky in that meeting. And, and the way to gain access to that is two ways. One is check out the YouTube channel, which is just master talk in one word. You'll have access to hundreds of free videos on how to speak. And the second way to keep in touch is to come to one of our free workshops. We do a free communication workshop over Zoom every two weeks that I facilitate myself. So you can really see firsthand a lot of the advice that we share with clients. And you can go to rockstarcommunicator.com to gain access to that and see us in the next live training. Excellent. That's great, Brendan. So the uh, free training that Brendan gives is www.rockstarcommunicator.com, rockstarcommunicator.com. And you can check him out on the YouTube, his YouTube channel, uh, one word, Master Talk on YouTube. Brendan, thank you so much for joining me here. What an excellent topic for us to have talked about as relates to raising private money for real estate. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. Such a pleasure. Absolutely. There you have it. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. And for us to keep having amazing guests, such as we had today, Brendan with Master Talk, uh, be sure and share, like, and follow uh, what you are listening to. If you're watching on uh, YouTube, be sure and click that bell so you don't miss out on upcoming episodes. If you happen to be listening on iTunes or Spotify, be sure and follow. You make the difference in passing the word about how great raising private money is. There you have it. Here's to taking your business to the next level. And we'll see you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Conner.